All right, I'm here today with another one of my Pepperdine brothers, Caleb Farmer. How you doing today? I'm doing good. Uh, we have a number of topics that we're going to explore, but I think most recently he released this really pretty video. I don't know if it was on IG or Twitter. It was somewhere where we are mutuals, and he showed how to give yourself a cut, how he gives himself a cut, and it's not any just average cut. Like It's a nice, clean taper with the lineup and everything. I could tell he's been working on his craft for quite a while. And I've seen a lot of dudes been hurting during this Corona season. So I wanted to bring him on. Um, before we get into like the specifics of how you got all advanced like that, how did you begin to, you know, get haircuts and stuff like that? Like, how did you grow up? Did you grow up going to a barbershop or your parents cut you or how did you get into it? Um, I think uh, the first time I had to cut my hair, um, it was really just to save money. You know what I mean? Um, so my stepfather, he had clippers in the house already and, um, he just showed me how to use the clippers. And, um, basically after that, you know, I just started practicing on my own hair. Um, then I got good at my own hair, uh, moved on to cutting my brother's hair and my cousin's hair and things like that. And that for was money my- for money or are you just practicing on them? Um, I don't know if it's. You know, just because they didn't want to pay me because I wasn't at a barber shop or because <laughs> it, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, I started, didn't see the quality yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was it was good quality, but it definitely improved. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, went to college and you know started cutting my hair. Um, you know, from then on, you know, I, even now I'm I still have a lot of improvements to make. Um, but I can pretty much come out with a decent cut um, and, you know, a sharp lineup and everything. Yeah, I, I seen it, man. And I've had my own movement with it, but I never put in the level of craft you did. I even cut a few people's hair back in the day, even in college and stuff, man. You could ask Pat and Adrian if you remember them, yeah. uh, you know what I mean? But I never did it like uh, like en masse. And the thing is, for me, I could do the most basic cut with the most basic lineup. There were no tapers. There were no fades. You know what I mean? It was just like yeah. the most basic, like number two, number one cut. So mm-hmm. let's start off with like brand. Was there any brand? I, I've been using wall. I don't know if that's mm-hmm. the best, but it's one of the ones I see people using. Like what were you using back then? And do you use uh, anything differently now? Yeah, I had the Andis Speedmasters. I had those for like 10 years, you know. That's so- good first clippers and I use those all the way into college and then you know uh they just uh you know they faded you know I couldn't use them anymore they got broke Mm -hmm. I didn't really know a clipper mechanic or anything Uh, (laughs) (laughs) but now you know I have a lot more resources I know where to get my clippers fixed uh, and sharpen and things like that and I I go with uh the wall brand now Um, okay so same one so I, I stumbled onto the right thing yeah yeah. Okay. And um, how about in terms of a, a thing that it took me years to understand was oiling. Do you use just whatever oil comes with the kit or do you have any particular oils? I know people even in the beard game are into like different oils nowadays, you know, whether it be like coconut or yeah, yeah. or random stuff, you know, avocado. Yeah. So is there is there any particular oil you use that, that yeah. helped it? And how frequently do you do you do that? Um, I think people don't think about that when they begin cutting their hair. Right. Yeah. So there's a body oil and hair oil, like hair and body oil. And then you have oil for the clippers. Right. So for the clippers, um, I usually use the one that's already in there. And then I have an extra one by Andis, you know, Andis and Wall are pretty much the top two brands. Um, But definitely using like coconut oil, argon oil, uh, tea tree oil, things like that. Uh, they give the beard or your hair a different shine, you know, after the cut, you know. So, um, you know, if you really want to distinguish yourself with your cuts and things like that, um, you can add that oil at the end and that just makes the picture pop. Um, and that that's after you've done the cut? Yeah, yeah. And then also, you know, if you're a waver, you know, you can put oils in your hair and that keeps the texture and the pattern looking nice. Um but yet yeah, it definitely definitely gives it like that extra spas, you know, even, you know, in the sun and in pictures and things like that, you know, and it's good for 
I don't know, uh, women, they use a lot of moisturizers and conditioners and things like that. You know, I, I'm not really into hair products or anything. Mm -hmm. um, I know the oil is good for your hair and your skin. That's good. Yeah, it's interesting you brought up waves. I remember being put on sometime in early college in high school and middle school i never really was into that i would just be growing stuff there was even a time i didn't see a barber for like a year and a half i didn't get a lineup an edge or nothing i just had that Huey newton you know what i mean uh <laughs> uh fro growing <laughs> oh no that's baby stuff bro i had i had a fro like this big man oh, yeah. I, it was it was ridiculous you know it was uh it was more like a personality or a character you know yeah, what i mean yeah. and um what <laughs> what'd you say i definitely rocked the fro at pepperdine just to yeah blackness <laughs> yeah exactly that's it that's right when you're a black face in a white space and right. you almost gotta represent extra exactly um sometimes you gotta put on a little extra but i know uh the wave thing like it was actually demise you know who who really taught me when I, we were roommates out in DC for a semester. And when I came back, that's when I perfected it. I used to just have it on top, but then I started doing the 360s. Yeah. And I know people got into it then and that's gone in and out of fashion and you know dreads and so many other things have become fashionable too. Mm -hmm. what, what type of cuts do people ask you for? And then what, what do you wanna do for yourself? Like, do you just give yourself, like, are you aiming for waves all the time? And then do you have periods where you wolf out? Or, or and what are other people asking you for too? Yeah, um, for me, um, I think a clean cut just for my head shape uh, is the fade, you know, just the all around fade. Um, it looks good with the waves on the top and everything, but the most common cuts, um, I would say, are like a fade and then a taper fade. Um, and then you have other cuts, you know, for people with longer hair or they want to do special styles and stuff like that. Um, but personally, I go through periods where I do uh, start woofing. And just to define that, it just means that you let your hair grow out and you brush it and um, you don't necessarily cut it, uh, but you do all kind of procedures uh, with like conditioner and oils and things like that. And you make sure you lay it down. And at the end of like at least eight weeks, um, you cut it and usually your pattern is uh, a little bit deeper and more uniform so that's i was just gonna ask that man eight <laughs> weeks sounds like a long time see i i thought wolfen was like four to six weeks but i'm glad that that you actually came out and defined it yeah. eight, eight weeks is is a lot for some cats like the... know, uh for me my hair is usually really long within four weeks uh-huh so i've had somebody tell me oh it ain't wolfing in, unless it's like eight weeks but um at eight weeks i pretty much have curls already you know yeah I, mean? I, I do it like four weeks and then I just try to make sure I'm consistent with the hard brush um, on top of um, the thick hair. Yeah, I think my hair is more like you where it's not the most coarse, but it's not the least coarse. You know what I'm saying? I always, always tell people it's halfway between a Jufro and a maybe an average Afro. And yeah. the thing is, I used to hate that that eight week stage. Cause that's when I didn't like my hair the most. That's when I would look the most ethnically ambiguous to people. People ask me if I'm Filipino or Indian yeah. and, uh, and I'm like, nah, I'm not, you know, and it's, uh, it's when it's biggest in a fro form or, or shortest, like in a, in a taper or a fade where I was like, okay, there's, you know, the look. So, so that's interesting. Yeah. Eight weeks. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to yeah. think about that one. Yeah, I don't know if you would make it though. <laughs> 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 uh, I think you have curly hair too. Um, and at like four weeks, my hair just starts to curl up and it's, um, and curls mess up the wave pattern. You know what I mean? Like it takes a lot more work to keep them laid down. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't really have any technique in particular to handle, um, the curls. So I just end up cutting it, you know, so. That's good, man. So, so throughout Corona, or the Rona, have people been reaching out to you or especially since you've been posting about it and see it, have, have, you, have you noticed people complaining about it online or anything like that? Yeah, I've seen a lot of uh, tweets and uh, posts and things like that, you know, with critiques on haircuts and things like that. Uh, but for the most part, I think people just watch my video on YouTube and Instagram mm -hmm. and that for their own cuts. Like, yeah, I've seen different people and I know they watch my video. <laughs> 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 you peep game oh good yeah that's good man that's good feedback yeah i think ray allen and like 
Charlemagne de God been some of the most prominent people I've seen who really been missing their barbers. I, I've seen, you know, different people asking uh, for situations, especially right now. Like just yesterday, mm -hmm. the governor came out with like new stuff where they're closing down hair salons and barber shops again and, and inside after having just begun. So it's, it's interesting to, to see all that too. I know also as a little bit of a segue, you, you've been a little bit of a, a foodie too. And it yeah. was interesting is I think you're, you're similar to me in that you've been on this, this weight loss journey and yeah. trying to work out and get fit at the same time, you're a brother who really appreciates food and, and some of the different, uh, yeah. lo locales. I, kn I know you maybe have some, some fam bam in the Palmdale Lancaster area, but I know, I remember back in the day, you and I would talk about South LA. And when I would ever tell you about where my church is, you're like, Oh, that's on the East side, bro. That's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the other side of the 110. That's, that's okay. a different area. But can you yeah. tell us a little bit about what it's like, you know, being a, a foodie either in the Palmdale Lancaster or South LA? I don't know which one you rep heavier. Uh, probably LA, South LA. Um, I'm out here in Palmdale, but I definitely, uh, my background, uh, where I stand on that is LA, <laughs> but, um, I think, it's like it's such a mixture of different things that you can get into um as far as like the different types of cuisine and things like that um so i don't know we have like ethiopian we have mexican we have uh we have chinese japanese we have vegan um so i mean it's just it's just really a good mixture of um a lot of different things and um, we have like Cuban, Brazilian, things like that. So whatever you have a taste for, you can get into, you can literally Google anything. Um, and you know, whatever new thing you're trying to try, you can probably find it in LA, uh, besides, you know, um, like Dominican food and things like that. I don't think you see that that much. Yeah, I was gonna say I've never seen a Dominican. I, most of the spots that you've said, I've I've definitely could. I was thinking in my head, different places where I could go, and mm -hmm. and see that. But yeah, Dominican's not one of them. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. I stick to, I stick to mostly like uh, Mexican food, um, vegan food, or um, I don't know. I choose a lot of healthy choices, but my favorites are Mexican, um, and. Uh, like uh just like southern food um yeah so, so mexican is a yeah. is a top food for me too so yeah. i want to i want to ask you about this cuz mexican in la comes up in so many different forms right mm -hmm. you could have your like tex mex or cali mex yeah. where it's like this fake mexican stuff right. you could have these authentic mexican joints which yeah. some people you know they don't like as much yeah. and then you have the the especially in south la all the street vendors, whether they have an occupational license or not, right. you know, they're selling the the yeah. corn on the cob with the chili limon, the yeah. little uh, the churros with the the lime and sauce too, and and all the various like watermelon candies and and exactly. all that. So, which, which which one are you talking about? I would say more authentic, and I would even consider those vendors uh, more yep. authentic uh, than uh, the restaurants or whatever. Yep. Yeah, when you got to order in Spanish. Right, right. But I have an accent, so they start speaking English. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, yeah. man, even even YG's been talking, uh, you know, singing in Spanish and and talking about how he grew up, you know, with Spanish around him. So uh, you see it getting incorporated in in the culture. So what, what type what type of things? OK, let's let's put it in two different categories. Tell us when you're just trying to eat for taste, what type of spots or any particular spots you could give them a shout out. And then versus when you're trying to eat healthy. And if there's ever such thing as a crossover, you can make that a third category of where it's where it's healthy and tasty. Um, OK, so if I'm just trying to get something good, I might uh, just go to a hole in the wall burger spot. Um, like best burger, master burger, fat burger, not really fat burger. That's like more of a, a chain, of mm -hmm. but I would go to like best burger, master burger, a one burger, um, any of those like corner spots just to get something good. Um, and then if I'm trying to find a happy medium, I might go to like, a, a vegan spot. Um, and some example, like stuff I eat in Inglewood, that's a good vegan spot. 
where you can find a medium where like it tastes good, but it's also healthy. And then um, I guess if I'm trying to be healthy and I know this is like very, I guess, eclectic, <laughs> um, but I will go to like Sprouts or something. Yep. Get a sandwich or um, Whole Foods or um, a health food store, um, whatever kind. Out here, we don't really have that many. Um, yeah, in in Ladera, uh, Ladera Heights, I know they got the the Sprouts. I don't know where the the closest Whole Foods would be. Um, in different areas. Also, a happy medium would be uh, simply wholesome. Yep, that's that's oh. on Slauson, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's a it's a Caribbean spot. Yeah, Caribbean um, health food store, uh, black owned. Um, so yeah, shout out to them. They have the Jamaican patties, you know, uh, all kinds of meals and smoothies, and you know they have the store right next to it with all kinds of stuff in there. Um, and books, yeah, they have books yep. on there. They have uh, live music. I've been there for live music before too. That's that's right next to one of our Ethiopian churches, which is on uh, uh, Shenandoah and Slauson, near La Cienega, that where the twenty four is too. Shabazz. Is it Shabazz or um No, no, no. It's uh it's called St. Mary's. Oh, okay. Um okay. Yeah, but that that's yeah, that's funny that you mentioned like the black owned too, especially people are looking for more of that. One of my cousins just opened up a, a vegan Ethiopian spot in in Lamert, but Lamert itself, you know, with hot and cool cafe mm -hmm. and a lot of these other spots, they they they've been having a lot of vegan food as well. And then you said Inglewood earlier. My sis just went to a uh, Hilltop Cafe the hilltop cafe oh. i've been there a few Never. times yeah another good one is sage cafe i don't know if you heard of that yeah in, yeah. in culver yeah in culver city yeah 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 Back. yeah they have a, the the it's a beer garden too in addition to being a vegan yeah. restaurant yeah what do you order there uh i'll get a pizza and then i get like a sunshine smoothie or something like that um, yeah i always get like some kombucha on tap and then whatever combination of like them cauliflower wings you know it's not chicken but it's close it's close <laughs> yeah i know i didn't name any mexican spots um i don't know uh there's one uh in culver city i think it's called La alba um, uh-huh something like that or i just i really go to a lot of hole in the wall so i don't really know the names of them. the names i was just thinking <laughs> that i was just thinking about that like you better know the names of the yeah. the individual persons on the yeah. like bicycle and stuff yeah. really i just you know if i see someone on the street cooking you know i'll go get that al pastor burrito or tacos you know what i mean so um yeah and yeah. there's no name there's no app there's, <laughs> you got cash <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, that's funny. I uh, I worked in a lot of schools in the past year, and I would see some of the really smart and savvy ones. They would wait right outside the school. They know when school's over, oh, and yeah. so right before school, they'll have um, you know different empanadas and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then after school, they'll have like the chips and and all sorts of different things or, yeah. or the burritos, like you mentioned. Yeah, I lived uh, I lived in a USC neighborhood, like near USC. And on my street growing up, we had like a, a tamale man that would come every morning on the weekends with uh, tamales. And we called it horchata, but it's really champurado. Um, so I guess he just told us that because we wouldn't be able to pronounce it or something. <laughs> which, which is champurado one of the, is that one of the other colors? Is it like the floral one or? No, it's a warm drink with like rice and cinnamon um, and milk and sugar. Um Oh, that yeah. sounds very similar to horchata. Yeah, but horchata is cold. Um, oh, yeah. okay. Purado is warm. Yeah. Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> so he simplified it for y'all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I guess you can call it either way, but like traditionally, if you say horchata, Hispanics are going to understand it as the cold uh, cinnamon milky drink. No, yeah, that's solid, man. A lot of, you know... I learned Spanish in school, but a lot of it definitely got solidified more when I was put in those like actual situations. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember they used to have a sentence like the cat is underneath the table or the cat is on top of the table. And I don't know if I've ever used that line in real life, but <laughs> knowing the, dis the differences between these drinks, oh, that's, okay. a <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's a lot more useful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What is the difference? I, I never heard of that. Uh, is that two different separate drinks? 
Oh, no, no. I'm saying the way you said. I'm not oh, saying okay. drinks. Yeah, I'm saying like, <laughs> so a sample Spanish sentence. I'll give you a sample Spanish sentence. El gato está encima de la mesa. The, the cat's on top of the table. Mm. El gato está debajo de la, de la mesa. The cat is under the table. Like, I've never had to say that. I've never been in a situation. Oh, I'm yeah. ready. If I ever see that situation happen in real life, you oh, best know, like... <laughs> Oh, there's a cat on top of the table. <laughs> yeah, I'll be ready to say it in Spanish. You know what I mean? But I didn't I didn't know the the champorado or chata distinction that you just said. Oh yeah. And, yeah. You know what I mean? Like that would have been more useful because of how many times I've I've been at uh Hispanic restaurants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I guess they understand it. Uh like especially if you if they can recognize that you aren't Hispanic then uh maybe they'll ask you like how to code or something like that just because you know uh people can relate to you you know even if they aren't hispanic you know i think that's good about la too just to mention that you know the diversity and the way that people can just understand each other from different backgrounds you know even in the midst of a lot of racial um issues and things like that i think it's more of a family where i came from like on my street, we had like, you know, we had a white person, we had mostly Hispanics, we had a couple of black families um, and we all got along very well, um, you know, and still to this day, we consider each other family, you know. So when I see um, all of these issues of like uh, black versus brown, um, I don't really understand where it's coming from, you know. Um, and you're talking about on social media or in the news or where, where, where are you seeing that? I'm seeing it on social media a lot. Um, yeah, just mainly social media and maybe, uh, maybe in the news a little bit, but mostly on social media. Yeah. I grew up in the Valley and my, my particular school was very skewed, you know, white in high school. So you wouldn't have seen anything like it, but some of the local schools to where I was living, they had a few, you know, race riots back in the day. Oh. Um, this is in the early to mid, you know, and 2000s. Mm -hmm. But um, that's beautiful the way that you say, like, you know, people will stigmatize parts of South LA. But like you're saying, it's family oriented. You're not, yeah. you're not seeing it from those people. Do, do you see anybody from where, you know, like back in the day, posting differently or reacting differently to like some of the stuff about the police protests and, and riots or, or the elections? Uh, most people I know, uh, they're either not on social media or, um, they're just, you know, outside of the group that's discussing, um, racial issues. Um, but most of the division that we saw in my neighborhood wasn't, uh hispanic versus black it was gang versus gang um, mm -hmm. and even if you were from a different gang if you lived on the same street because you were on that street and you knew each other and because you were you know because of that family like atmosphere it doesn't it, doesn't, it didn't even matter like what gang you were from you know what i mean like we all live in the same place we were all you know we all come from the same background um we're, str we're struggling you know, with certain issues, like you're struggling with issues, you know, as far as like paying bills and, you know, going to school and getting good grades and, you know, trying to stay safe, you know, uh, when you go through that kind of atmosphere or that environment, um, it really creates like a certain camaraderie um, between everybody who's going through the same experience. And you don't have to be, you know, black or white or brown to have the same you know, experience or background uh, based on where you live. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. No, it makes 100%. Two of my favorite rappers mm -hmm. were, you know, uh, RIP Nipsey Hussle mm -hmm. and Killer Mike. And through their lives, that's exactly what they try to do is while not trying to erase the, the differences people have because they're from different blocks, mm -hmm. they would highlight the kind of shared economic issues that exactly. you mentioned that that are faced right. and try to build bridges and unite i mean mm -hmm. like w again yg and nip were from different sets but mm -hmm. they would get together they would have the blue and the red and the same music video right yeah. or they would get together against donald trump or you know what i mean like yeah. they would collaborate and nipsey would talk about a lot about how he would intentionally 
go to hoods and places where people think like he's not allowed and not permitted. And part of that is like a celebrity flex, but also mm -hmm. part of it is like, rather than demonizing each other, he's trying to humanize each other. And then uh, Killer Mike got his show on Netflix where he got the, the Bloods and the Crips of Atlanta mm -hmm. to create their own competitive soda companies to oh. Coke and Pepsi. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw that, like the Crippa Cola and stuff. I, I and think great idea, I haven't seen it though. Yeah, yeah. I, I wish it wasn't a soda. You know, I wish it was something a little healthier. Maybe yeah. it could have been like a like a Perrier or a Pellegrino alternative. You know, like a mineral water to at least get the fizz uh, without the sugar. Yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah. He promoted them, and he had them at like the farmers market. You know what I'm saying? And they would have like friendly competition, like oh, come buy ours versus come buy theirs, because they had two different products yeah. that they were selling. Yeah. Except instead of an illicit product, it's like bringing them into the the normal market out of the black market. Yeah. And uh, I, you know, I appreciate anybody who's building bridges like that. I think it was like the first big LA truce. Um, you know, after a few years ago, when people try to do the hundred nights, a hundred deaths thing. I don't know if you remember that. Um, the first big truce was at Nip's like funeral, and you had people of all different stripes, like Christians, Nation of Islam. And yeah. various gangs like yeah. showing up in solidarity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think regardless of like your religious background or your gang and all these other factors that we define ourselves by, uh, at the end of the day, uh, we all live in the same type of community um, per se. Um, I think um, you know there's a lot of people that are growing up. Um, you know, in apartments or in neighborhoods where even if you don't have gangs, you have crime or you have, uh, you know, certain issues with police or um, things like that. And I think that creates a certain kind of commonality um, uh, in regards, you know, uh, I guess to economics and um, where, you know, the location where you live um, and I guess other factors. Um, you know, I think uh, what I'm trying to say is like the experience um, of living there, um, even even, you know, living in a different place uh, and having a different gang in there, you still have like gang culture. You know what I mean? That you that you are aware of or that um, that you're not necessarily a part of, but you understand it because you're in it. You know what I mean? So um, I don't know. I, I try to look at um the things that we have in common rather than our differences um and i guess try to create like common ground and understanding you know what i mean um so i don't know you know i don't know if i'm saying that clearly but i think we have a lot more in common you know even down to like our flesh and blood you know it doesn't matter what color it is you know what i mean it's all made of the same kind of cells you know we all have a brain we all have uh you know, two eyes, you know, if we're, you know, if normally, you know, if we're blessed, um, we all, you know, have a mother and father, we all have family issues, you know, or family members and things like that. Um, so if we take the time to step back and, um, you know, try to see um, ourselves or, you know, if you believe in God or a higher power, try to see God in everyone. I think that, you um, you know, can create the kind of unconditional love and peace and support um, that everyone is, you know, really trying to go after at this time, or uh, even if we're not going after it, um, there's a need for it, you know what I mean? Um, and we're seeing that right now, um, more evidently, you know, in, in the protests and everything that's going on um, with the election and things like that. Um, you know, I can I can go all day. <laughs> no, I'm with you, bro. I like I've created this platform for that exact reason, mm -hmm. because I think the key to civilization is dialogue. And I think, you know, the moment we stop talking to each other, um, that's the moment where we're going to start like fist fighting. Like that's that's where it leads to. And then, you know, ultimately death. And so I've, I've tried to create this platform and, and make it as diverse as possible, you know, in terms of intellectual uh, diversity, in terms of diversity of, of fields of interest and, and exploration. And that's why I invited you on here is, mm -hmm. is to present, you know, one more avenue to, to help people 
try to improve themselves and, and learn a, a little bit more about about these topics so they could do their own research. And of course, you know, you and I both know we're all we're both Christians, too. So we have we do have that that faith in God right. and and ultimately that, you know, that peace that is beyond all all comprehension that mm -hmm. is is guiding to us. And I, I assess this situation, even if they're not explicitly religious in the way you and I are, mm -hmm. I assess these people and the, the, the way, the kind of phrase I use often mm -hmm. is that they're spiritually thirsty, you know, that yeah. they're spiritually thirsty and, and even further, they, they thirst for the gods, you know what I mean? Like they miss gods, you right. know what I'm saying? And right. you can see that in, in their behavior. Right. You know, whether, whether it's conservatives who want to worship the American flag or right. whether it's uh, progressives and, and other groups that are involved in, in black lives matter. These people feel some sort of indignation or righteous anger. You know, they're not neutral. No, nobody's neutral out here. Exactly. And you see them motivated to do stuff. Mm -hmm. So whether it's explicit or not, you know, mm -hmm. they're <laughs> they're thirsty for it. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So I, I appreciate you coming on, man. And anytime we got any other topics you're ready to explore, hit me up. You got my line and we'll do this again sometime. All right. Hey, man. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. No problem. All right.